Have you tried Anchor FM yet? What are you waiting for? Anchor is the only platform that includes all the tools that you need to launch your podcast instantly, including monetization. That's right. Start making money right now. Record, edit, distribute, and earn all right from your Anchor FM dashboard. It's time to set sail on that podcast that you've been dreaming of making. Just don't forget your Anchor. Anchor FM, the easiest way to make a podcast ever. There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff. 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going, officer? I'd say around 90. But what about us? Memories. You're talking about memories. Good, now have a drink. I don't want anything of his or any part of it. Except his life. I wonder if I know what you mean. I wonder if you want that. Play it for her, you can play it for me. I lived a few weeks while she loved me. Waiting for a lady. Someday you'll understand that. Got some news that's gonna take a lot of attention off you and Laura. Stop it, yes, I can't take any more of it! I should be in the corner. You know the story? What story? Maybe because he was drunk. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. Well, I'll give her the message. But there is sleep all over America. Welcome to the Speakeasy Noir Cast a podcast discussing film noirs of yesterday and neo-noirs of today. Each week, we will deliver a discussion and analysis of classic and neo-noir films, all mixed in with our unintelligible banter. Your host for the show, Carly Street and Jason D. Morris. All right. Carly, we're back again. Hello. Feels like I haven't talked to you in a whole week. Isn't that weird? (laughs) <laughs> so weird. <laughs> this should be a daily show. No, it shouldn't. Never mind. No. It should not be a daily show. <laughs> It'd be like Big Brother, day 297. Jason and Carl still <laughs> can't agree on a film. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a good one. All right. So I'm going to jump right into the. What? See what? Wait, what? Sorry. I, just, I step, stepped on your. Toes there. Hold on. Hold on. I'm still tipping. Right. What? Hello? Are you there? I'm here. <laughs> don't ignore me. You know I'm here. I'm just trying to talk over you so I don't have to listen to you. That's <laughs> understandable. <laughs> it works for straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. What'd you say now? No, that's it. I'm pitching my own show. I'm cutting you out. It's just going to be me in the Big Brother style <laughs> in my little cupboard with my blanket, muttering to oh, myself. Funny. I'd watch that or listen to it. (laughs) All right, jumping right in, guys. Our drink for tonight is called The Snitch. All right, because the movie tonight has got something to do with snitches, I think. Sort of anti-snitch, maybe. Uh, So The Snitch is one and a half ounces of mescal. A quarter ounce of Campari, one ounce grapefruit shrub. I don't know what a grapefruit shrub is. <laughs> it's just getting weird. A half ounce of lime juice, a half ounce of simple syrup, a pinch of salt, and a grapefruit twist. My goodness. Wow. It's like two, four, five, six, seven ingredients in this drink. Take me free way. Yeah. Add ice to an old-fashioned glass to chill the glass. Add ice to the tin side of a Boston shaker. In the mixing glass, add mescal, capari, grapefruit shrub, lime juice, simple syrup, and a pinch of salt. Pour the contents of the mixing glass into the ice, into the ice tin, and secure the glass to the tin. Shake the contents so the ice sounds different and the contents are cold. Open the Boston shaker, strain the contents of the shaker into the ice-filled old-fashioned glass garnish with grapefruit twist and serve so basically throw everything into the shaker and shake it (laughs) (laughs) i think i can cope with that (laughs) yeah this is gonna be um i don't like grapefruit so i don't know i don't know how i'm gonna do with this one this is gonna be a a sort of tart drink um but it does sound interesting i'd be curious to uh try this one out So, guys, if you have the ingredients for this, uh, you should make a snitch and uh, 
have a drink with us and, and follow along as we discuss the movie. So, Carly, tonight's movie is The 39 Steps. Another The 39 Steps. <laughs> the show is The 39 of, Steps. <laughs> of another 39 Steps. <laughs> yes. Um, so this, uh, this, uh, yeah, I don't even know what to say about this. Let's, let's just jump into the trailer. Here's the trailer for The 39 Steps. Irrepressible Kenneth Moore and irresistible Tyna Elk, star of many Hollywood successes in The 39 Steps. Richard Haney, a gay adventurer on the run. Please forgive me. My name's Richard Haney. Oh, excuse me. I'm a police officer. If you're looking for Richard Haney, this is the man you want. Your name, Haney? Police want Richard Haney for a murder he did not commit, and they can't catch him. A ruthless gang of international spies want Haney because he knows too much, but they can't hold him. Oh, Fisher, don't be such a chump. This is important. Contact Scotland Yard. Here it is, oh. Haney. You get your arm broken. This lovely girl doesn't want Haney, and yet she just can't get away from him. As long as you stay, he stays. We're all right. You mean you'll be wanting to spend the night here? Yes. You'll be man and wife, I suppose. Yes. Want any help? No. Fisher. Place yourself on the operating table. All right, you needn't look so alarmed. I'm not going to lie on that bed. <laughs> as long as you're chained to me, you can't very well avoid it. Come on. Ow! <laughs> I wish you wouldn't keep saying ow like that. In a respectable house like this, it might be misinterpreted. Tyner Elk, romantic and beautiful, teamed with Kenneth Moore at his brilliant best. I don't think I should make a dash for it if I were you. Remember, you're Richard Haney, wanted for murder. I think there's only one answer, Mr. Haney. Don't touch it. Where are the 39 steps? Come on, answer me. Where are the 39 steps? No. Uh, produced by Betty E. Box. Screenplay by Frank Harvey, um, again based on the the book The Thirty Nine Steps by John uh, Bu- Buchan. Oh, we're back to that again. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> Bouchon. I was going to say you should do it in a posh accent, so it, you just skim over it. Jean Bouchon. Jean Jean Bouchon. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this time, starring Kenneth Moore as our Hanny character um yeah you're gonna love my synopsis this this, film. <laughs> this is another uh united kingdom uk version of the film and as such um carly is gonna yeah she's gonna have to be the driving force on this one because she's british and um i'm mad at her for making me watch another 39 steps <laughs> <laughs> i'm mad at myself for this one <laughs> yeah i have a feeling it's going to be a very short podcast <laughs> <laughs> uh but 
being as it may, Carly, I, I, I am excited. This is the one portion of the show I'm excited about. And that's hearing your, in a nutshell, synopsis, because mine would be, well, I won't give away what mine would be, but I'll tell you later. <laughs> so go ahead and give us, your, give us your synopsis on yet another version of the 39 Steps. Okay, but I want to hear yours before the end of the show too. Okay, I will. I will I'll tell you. It's very short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's crap. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I tried really hard with this one. Okay. And now it's time for Carly's super famous in a nutshell synopsis. A heavily sedated 007 somehow manages to bring down the worst spy ring with absolute no urgency whatsoever. <laughs> they're walking, they're not running. Robert Powell ran across Scotland. He didn't yeah. even go fast on the bicycle. <laughs> no, he did not. <laughs> he went so slow. The country is at stake, man. What are you doing having a coffee? <laughs> It's true. Oh my God, that's true. I didn't even he think about that. He's so true. Into shorts to enjoy. Who has shorts on in Scotland? <laughs> yeah. like he's going to a tropical island. Everybody like was- <laughs> is in scarves and woolly hats, and he's there on a bicycle going two mile an hour, if that, in bloody shorts. <laughs> yeah, with his shirt like unbuttoned down to the belt, and like in these really short shorts. They are short <laughs> shorts. Like- they are the shortest oh, yeah. shorts he's- in history. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh my goodness do, do you know the best thing about it all as well is it i i don't know if i've misread it or maybe my brain just started to to slowly shut down i'm pretty sure that it's made by someone called rank studios well that just fucking says it all doesn't it because <laughs> the film is rank <laughs> rank <laughs> it is it's made by the rank organization <laughs> And it's distributed by Rank Film Distributors. <laughs> I mean, there we go. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Which is, I really like Kenneth Moore as well, though. So I was really, really sad. Yeah, I he's, didn't he's great. Like him. He's just the wrong movie for him. He would. He should just be charming people and getting bloody details of their personal address and just, just doing something else. Just why? Why? Well, I don't know. I don't know. And you know, this this version has does have a milestone to it, and that's that it's the first color version of the Thirty Nine Steps. <laughs> that that's about as far as it goes as noteworthy. Well, we get to see how Tandy's legs are in Scotland. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yes, no urgency. That that's a that was fantastic that you put that in there because that's the truth from the very beginning. Like I I from the from the get go of this movie again this season I'm not doing any research pre to watching. Um, so I was instantly baffled by this film as soon as I put it on. We we open in like this this park area, and we see a, a little sailboat going across, which is delivering some sort of message. Um, and then we get into, we get into the baby rattle scene, which I still just don't understand (laughs) this whole, this whole thing with the bait. Is it, I don't know if it's a baby rattle or a pacifier or some sort of baby toy thing that he is very insistent in returning to this woman who is very insistent that it is not hers. And I'm just like, Give it up, man. It's not hers. Like, Put it her in go. the bin. Didn't your mom ever teach you not to pick stuff up off the floor? Yeah, it was just so, what is, why is he still trying? Like, I just don't get it. She said, it's not like she doesn't know if it's not hers or not. <laughs> or <laughs> like remember it. If it's, hers. <laughs> it's just like, come on. You can't just force it. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, no, it's not mine. <laughs> Would you leave me alone? It gets very creepy very fast because he's just like not letting it go. He's not. And it. That rattle's going some... back in there with that baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's just funny. 
<laughs> it gets to the point where it's um, like, are you trying to steal this kid? Are you trying to get your hands close to the baby? <laughs> <laughs> right. And there's no baby, right? It's just like, <gasps> it's so funny. Uh, and yeah, I just, it, it, it was, it's so over the top in those weird ways that it's not grounded at all in reality. Even like the espionage spy elements like that. They're not even a mystery. Just, Mr. Memory no, isn't a they're mystery. Not at all. It's quite obvious what's happening in the first 20 minutes. He's got that many bloody Absolutely. question marks around him. It's like the Riddler. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. Oh, no. And, you know, it's like I I understand. Okay, so, so um, the director, uh, Ralph Thomas, wasn't – it's not like he was aching to make this film. It was – presented to him i guess from the studio they wanted a remake right so he decided that he didn't he wanted to stand apart from hitchcock's and he even went to hitchcock and was like hey you know obviously you know your film is fantastic um they're wanting me to direct this film are you okay with that and hitchcock is basically like i mean go ahead it's gonna it's be gonna rubbish. suck <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, that's fantastic. <laughs> and he goes about it in such a strange way. He decides to try to make it comical, whimsical. Um, and he does that. I mean, it definitely has that element to it. And that's where um, Kenneth Moore shines. I mean, yeah, but it's charm, just so. But it's not enough to carry it through, is it, for more than about half an hour? No, not at all. I, I don't. Th- I th- he he obviously might be a charming guy, but it feels like the scenes where he's supposed to be charming are so forced that they just come off creepy. Um, and and it's just it's off putting almost. I almost I'm. It's one of those types of movies where I watch him and I'm just like I'm kind of embarrassed for him. It makes me uncomfortable, like watching him have to try to charm his way into like a situation and it just being awkward (laughs) i know like when he's like oh please forgive me my name is hannah and then attacks some woman and leaps off the train (laughs) i'm just like what the hell is going on (laughs) robert powell never did that (laughs) no just saying (laughs) no the whole train train sequence is just like weird (laughs) among many things in this movie well, it just, I didn't realize I, yeah. until afterwards. Isn't some of the same dialogue as the original Hitchcock film just used again? Yeah, I think that I think there is. There was there's a tremendous amount of familiarity in this film. Like from, I almost think that scene for scene, it's pretty much the same as Hitchcock's. It's just slightly updated, you know. And the most glaring, obvious portion of that is the um the, again the political rally everybody every version of this movie seems to do that scene drastically different and in this version of it he <laughs> i don't know why but for some reason he finds his way into a, a an all girls school where he's trying to teach them what is he trying to teach them how to plant plants or something i have no idea i was just the only the, the only little bright spot was when in that scene i was like oh it's joan hickson she played miss marple that oh. was it that was it <laughs> yeah and then I, she I went very, away i was <laughs> yeah I, I was very um off taken off guard by the comedic feel of this film uh, it was just the first thing I noticed and the score really tried to help the, uh, the comedic feel along. Um, and knowing the story and having certain expectations, <laughs> it just left me super confused. Uh, and you know, maybe Kenneth Moore was like a, a pretty big name at the time, but I, I just – and again, I, I just think it was just the wrong role for him. I just found him very average in this role. Like I just don't think – his acting style just didn't fit with like the scenarios and the situations and everything. It was just so odd. It was just no, a very odd was, choice. But he's been in loads of stuff that's really, really good. Yeah. I mean I'm sure he has. I, I just – 
they this was just a bad choice all the way around. It took yeah. me by surprise because I was, you know me, and the 39 Steps life. Um, yeah. I thought this uh-huh. was going to be great. And I I thought that I'd seen this, but I can't recall watching this one. I mean, I think you definitely would recall his weird jokes to the all-girls school, you know, about what a flower planting class thing I, I, you would have you would have to remember that would be burned in your memory. That's so weird and awkward. <laughs> burn in, <laughs> burn in my yeah. memory. Well, to be fair, him going uphill on a bloody cycle in the middle of the Tour de France when the you know the spy secrets about to be revealed <laughs> is burnt in my bloody memory. Yeah. Why I mean, is he going uh, uphill? Why? Why? I know what well, I'll do. I'll go uphill. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, and then they stopped the guy. It's the wrong. Well, it depends on which part you're talking about, but they stopped the other guy and it's the wrong guy. And it's just like, how did they do that? Because I literally felt like I was following him, but it wasn't him. <laughs> so I got really confused in that part. But then when he stops in the field and takes a break to eat a sandwich <gasps> and take a nap. <laughs> well, he's, you know, man's tired. Man's man is tired so. from all that cycling. And then, and then wakes up to them tilling the, the field, and he's like, "Okay, where do I go? Do I go here? Do I go?" And I'm like, "It was this weird sort of like convoluted like thing." It was oh, just, just so like, silly. Tries to outrun some farming equipment and almost gets decapitated. <laughs> right. It's like he sticks around and waits for the cops to come to search the field. I don't know. It's funny. Where I did you find. See my, hear my note about the description of Hannah. <laughs> Yeah, I've written, please do, yeah. Hannah is like 007 on muscle relaxants. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, I wouldn't even equate him to 007, but yeah, it, I mean, if, if 007 was on drugs, that would be him. Yeah, he was. I mean, my, my note on him was, um, let's see, uh, events just don't seem to spring up any sense of excitement or intrigue. He just... <laughs> casually move along through the story because he does it's just like nothing's important today (laughs) you know and it's just it's so strange it's uh... (laughs) yeah i don't i just when you when you take a look at the book the source material you take a look at the films that came before it and then you create this nonsensical version a familiar story that people already know because the other films are 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 known and were you know uh, i guess well reviewed um it just it's almost like they tried hard to make a worse version (laughs) because they were more concerned about standing apart from the other films than actually making a good film like it was more important to to just be different. And I guess in a way I, I I understand that, but it was, I mean, we're 20, 20 years removed, I think from the Hitchcock version, or maybe even more, maybe 30 years removed. Like, I don't think there was any danger of sticking with the routine, so to speak, and just trying to create a great film. Um, And I mean, it, it, there's just some off the wall decisions, off the wall decision makings on this film. That just, uh, I mean, I guess it it does make it memorable, you know, in a in a way. But they're just so uh, wacky. <laughs> just, I mean, I did enjoy Sid James as as this the strange lorry driver, but then um, I thought yeah. I'd rather turn this off and watch a Carry On film. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, do, I can't fault any of the actors at all in this movie, like at all. I mean, either it's a miscast or poor script and poor direction, you know. Um, but there is one one cool shot in the movie that I really liked a lot. Um, there's a scene where from Hanny's room, uh, I guess a couple of the I can't remember if it's the cops or just bad guys or whatever at a phone booth and uh the light sort of shines through the phone booth onto the ground and it looks like a spider web 
sort of thing. And I, I kind of took that as like being like a foreshadowing of like this web of deceit and this web of uh, espionage that's happening. I thought that was a really cool sort of thing. Maybe it was Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> Sp- it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> spider Henny, spider Henny. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you'll never hear that again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that one shot I thought was really cool and was great foreshadowing. Had this actually been a serious film, but it really just didn't feel like it. It just felt like it it went on too much on the comical side. And it just didn't play well comedy wise. You know, I don't know. I also found you know, I don't know. I just found him his him just too creepy. <laughs> He's just, just too like this. The taking off the stocking scene, I thought it was brilliant in the Hitchcock version. Um, and then in this one, it just it just was really creepy to me. And he was just such a a rude jerk, <laughs> you know, that I just didn't. I, I don't know. I just couldn't. I I didn't like him. Um, and even though he's supposed to be charming, it was just like, why, yeah, that, why that, would she have liked him? That's the problem that sometimes um, British films fall into. You know, like Hugh Grant, the charming buffoon. Now, he's uh-huh. just rude and an idiot. There's nothing charming about yeah, I, him in the slightest. And maybe that's where this weird Hugh Grant sort of characters come from. Because that that was I guess similar. I don't know that was similar I, things. I, I don't things. understand it as a as a guy. I don't understand it, but maybe as a woman that's attractive in some way. But I just found him like I'm looking not at in the slightest. He just yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's really weird. But I just thought yeah, he was just super rude and just a jerk, and I don't know, you know. But then after that scene, it seemed like most of the movie played out like the original Hitchcock film. Like there wasn't a whole lot that was different, um, you know, besides those flourishes of comedy and and whatnot. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot uh, story wise at all that was new or refreshing. Like they didn't even try, you know, yeah. as to where at least um, the the seventies version, seventies, right? I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, was uh, they they switched some things to sort of refresh it, and they had some cool set pieces and things like that. Um, this just didn't do that. They, they, it's just like they, they didn't even. It's like they gave up. They had no will to live. <laughs> just like <laughs> I feel like the writers were just like, "Why are we doing this?" And so it reflected that in the script. Um, and it, I don't know. It was a very, it was a ma- major disservice to the original story, to the book, to Hitchcock's film. Um, it just was such a letdown and an oddly, oddly made film. They would possibly um, have been better doing the spoof route if they were going to go for that kind of bumbling, oh, absolutely. charming sort yeah. of sort of honey. Then maybe they would have been better to go down a spoofy route of the Hitchcock version, where yeah. he almost pointed out the things about it that wouldn't work. Or, do you know what I mean? He was kind of a bit more mm-hmm. of, a, of a spoofy character overall because then you would have happily accepted him. Doing the things that yeah, he did I could totally accept him being like rude or yeah, whatever. Like I can imagine like Hugh Laurie playing uh, playing this character in like a spoof version. That would be hilarious to me, or you know something along those lines, um, because he could play it deadpan and, and serious, and the rest of the world around him could be funny, you know. And that would that would make more sense to me than the reverse, where the rest of the world is serious, but our lead character is goofy in a way or doesn't have a cab in the world trying to be yeah it does just doesn't matter it's just whimsical and and doesn't (laughs) it's just weird (laughs) i don't know and then you know as we (laughs) they do the whole weird bookend thing with (laughs) the baby rattle again (laughs) just like crack me up i'm like oh and she's like leave it alone (laughs) yeah it's like uh, why why would you even do that (laughs) (laughs) yeah like that's actually going to happen again for starters, but it's like, it was already a weird scene with him trying to force this baby toy onto somebody who's clearly stating it's not mine. Leave me alone, weirdo. And he's like, no, no, it's definitely yours. (laughs) 
<laughs> we're gonna replay that we're gonna go back to that and end this movie this way <laughs> Don't Can you imagine if somebody came up to you when you're pushing your uh, kid around the park? Like, oh, here's your rattle. No, I'm all right, thank you. No, here's your rattle. You'd be like, I'm on the phone to the police. Some guy's trying to kidnap me here. I don't know what's going on. He's shaking a rattle at me. It's not mine. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was extremely weird. It's just, it's funny. It's it's funny, but not supposed to be funny in that way, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> This movie makes me sad. (laughs) So, hey, Carly, why don't we take a break and listen to an ad from one of our sponsors? You're listening to the Speakeasy Noir Cast, the show that brings you binge drinking with a side of noir with your host, Carly Street and Jason D. Morris. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I just... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> did this break you? Is this is this the spell that broke your brain? It break? did. It did. Yeah. I mean, I you know I, another thing is just like in the seventies version. This was my major issue with the seventies version. Um, is that people just find him? There's no way the cops just show up out of nowhere. How do they do that? How do they know where he's at? It just doesn't make any sense. And he's always like near misses with them. But like, why are they even there? <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. To be honest, the speed that Kenneth Moore was moving, they could probably caught him on fault. <laughs> I guess. So. Just and it's funny because I have actually. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Um, I had a note actually uh, um, about uh, the most realistic part was Hanny biking uphill. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I just well, I if he'd know. have had some urgency, that could have been a lovely metaphor for you know his his struggle and his journey, just constantly fighting uphill. But no. Well, yeah, but I mean, he's he's so slow and so no urgency throughout the whole movie. The only time that that actually made sense was him trying to bike uphill. <laughs> like he's <laughs> obviously struggling, you know, it's tiring. So it's like that was him through the rest of the movie. <laughs> Just taking a nap. You know? I'm so tired from that. I'm yeah. ride. Bloody hell. <laughs> I ain't got time for this. <laughs> right? <laughs> I need a sandwich. Let's have a picnic. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wish I had more to say, but I really don't. This movie was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just terrible. There's no, this, there's really no noir to this. I don't think. No. Um, to me, it, it almost played like a Disney espionage movie. <laughs> no way. I expected uh, Herbie to show up. And that give him a that ride. would have been a film, <laughs> right? <laughs> Herbie, so you know, finds him in the field. Come with me, sunshine. It'll all be done in just in two minutes. Right. <laughs> so, I don't know. With that, Carly, I guess we can go ahead and give our ratings for this. I think so. I think we're done being horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I'm I'm going to give this movie a, a one star. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I loathed it. I hated watching it. And it might have been because I've already watched two other ones uh, with the same story, and this just this one just being so bad in comparison to them that it just knocks some potential stars off. Um, I just I I feel like all of the elements here are wrong, um, and and they made the same mistake as the '70s version, which I guess this one comes before the '70s version, but um, just the mistake of the cops just showing up and somehow just miraculously knowing where he's at. Um, it's just, I don't know, a terrible issue for me. Um, I, I know it's supposed to be funny, but I didn't find it funny in a, uh, intentional way. I found it funny in a terrible way, (laughs) (laughs) but all the elements are wrong. I think the wrong director, the wrong actors, everything just to me just didn't mesh. The music was terrible. Um, yeah, it was just all wrong for me. One star. Wow. 
to be fair though, I only gave it a two star. And that is bad for me. I throw out sevens for stuff that I don't want people to feel bad. So. (laughs) Well, I mean, I'm, yeah, I I don't, I I don't typically rate even bad movies this low, but I, for some reason, this one just, maybe it was just when I watched it or something. I just, it just struck me as like, I dislike this movie. Um. You know, because it's not like it's a movie without a budget or anything. It's got known stars in it and it's based off of a well received book and there are previous films. Like there's no reason for this movie to have turned out this way. None uh, whatsoever. Yeah. No, I I based my my disgustingly low score on um I really like the character of Hannah and this to me was just not that character. They might as well have not remade the 39 Steps and made a completely different film because I just can't see. In the Hitchcock version, he was charming and he was, he did, he could have carried the film. If mm-hmm. this, I like Kenneth Moore a lot, but he's not anywhere close for what I like. Even, in, even in, that in the character. Robert Powell version, Robert Powell was pretty charming. I mean, it was, well, he Robert worked. Powell's was a lot closer to the, to the actual character of Hannah. Mm-hmm. which is probably why I like it so much and I can overlook a lot mm-hmm. of other stuff that maybe you, you and other people wouldn't. Um, but at the same time, it works bad for this film because he's so far removed that every little thing bugs me. Right, right. So. Yeah, no, that's understandable. <clears throat> so... There we have it. We've got a one star and we've got a two star. I think these are the lowest, the lowest scores that we've given any film so far. Yeah. If I recall. Yeah. Our stars. Why are we doing stars? Aren't we supposed to be doing gens? Did we lose? We lost an element from our show. Did you change it again and not tell me? Oh, yes. I supposedly, I guess, did. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right. This movie doesn't deserve any bottles of gin. <laughs> no, no bottles of gin. That is two shakes it for can cocktail have the shaker stars. at best. <laughs> yeah. So, folks, there you have it. We apologize for this short episode, but it's sometimes a movie is just uh, not worthy of a full hour. <laughs> well, no, it's because you don't want to show the people what we're really like. An hour of us moaning. <laughs> We'll be on dartboards right. across the land <laughs> with darts right. getting thrown gotta, in our heads. <laughs> we got to save some dignity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, with that, uh, we hope you enjoy the 39 steps more than we did. Um, check it out nonetheless and see what you think and maybe compare it to the previous versions that we've talked about and see which one you like the best. Maybe uh, maybe this works for you. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But uh, let us know. Uh, give us a call. Leave us a message. Send us an email. Whatever you like. And tell us what you thought. Of, uh, a lot of people that would like it as a standalone film. If they've maybe. not come across the others or the book or anything. I imagine there's a lot of people on a Sunday afternoon that might watch it and quite enjoy it. I imagine it's own entity. Wrong, but <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think so. But, I mean, maybe... <laughs> I, can, I think it's like the second know, highest no. film at the at the British box office that year. Yeah, I think that was just banking off of uh, you know their talent, you know, maybe. not knowing what they're getting into, you know. Yeah, Kenneth Moore's um, pretty pretty but, uh, popular, so maybe they've all just flooded to see him. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely a possibility there. I don't I don't uh, I don't see this as being a uh, big blockbuster movie, but other than you know people not really knowing what they're getting into and and seeing an actor that they they like and going to see it but i don't know folks uh you guys watch it you tell us what you think and uh and let us know all right and uh until next time bye bye he's looking at you kid thanks for joining us this week on the speakeasy noir cast make sure to visit our website resurrectionfilms.net where you can subscribe to the show on itunes stitcher or any of your favorite podcast apps so you'll never miss a show While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. 
If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, The Dark Side of Acting Up and The Dark Side of Acting Up Volume 2, now available on Amazon. Or you can check out one of our films, also available on Amazon Prime. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Speakeasy Noircast.